speaking of the terrain at the moment, um, just to um, kind of switch the conversation a little bit to the landscape we're all facing after the convoy. Um, it was interesting, the deal was presented by both parties actually as a response to this moment. Uh, Trudeau said in his speech that, you know, it's responding to the growing threats to democracy, hyperpartisanship, toxic polarization. And then there are these suggestions that the deal was actually forged in the post-convoy conversations that were happening between Jagmeet Singh and Trudeau. So with that in mind, like, let's talk a little bit about um, how the political landscape in Canada has shifted um, since the occupation of Ottawa started. Um, L, it's it's been a it's been a month um, since since that convoy's occupation ended and I guess I thought we could start um, by looking kind of at, in hindsight, at what we think uh, the political and economic forces were that, that fueled those protests. Yeah, well, there's always what it claims to be and what it probably is. Mm -hmm. So again, we had the pretense that this was, uh, you know, a working class movement. We had all these people saying, you know, this is a worker led movement. And as we know, this has been, you know, spoken to death, like 90% of truckers were vaccinated and were not part of this movement mm -hmm. at all. Um, South Asian truckers, of course, have been raising issues about discrimination within the industry, and that wasn't anything we cared about, right? So even the construction of this is truckers and like what the word trucker is supposed to invoke in terms of like, you know, the salt of the earth, like white working class that, you know, is the proper kind of worker, um, which even that is is such a, like this invocation always of the working class, particularly by the right um, when obviously most of the working class now is like your Uber driver, it's like your retail worker. So I don't know. I mean, speaking, I've said this already, but, you know, I mean, the idea that freedom is only constituted through whether or not you can go to like Boston pizza or whether they're, they're going to check your like vaccine passport versus, you know, street checks and racial profiling of black people, um, indigenous people still uh, not having rights on reserve. I mean, the very same people that say, this is about freedom of movement. And then, you know, we need to secure the border. And you're like, oh, but what about freedom of movement for migrant workers? What about freedom of movement for people seeking other economic activity, right? You're not interested in deconstructing that. So it was freedom, as has always been understood in Canada, which is freedom for white people. Um, so you got like, you know, the National Post, like having pictures of very generic arrests and being like, you know, never before in Canada have we seen this kind of violence. And it's like, someone being like normally handcuffed, you know? And it's like, there's no knees on necks. There's no chainsaws, you know, tearing down your, your building on ancestral territory. There's no, um, you know, like, like person in a wheelchair being like dragged out as happened to, you know, Sarah Jama and the youth in Hamilton, right? Like we're not seeing any of that, but suddenly the minute that it's like these white bodies encountering policing after weeks of being given every, like, please leave. No, please leave again. No, here's your fifth notice. And I, again, I don't agree with, like, I, I don't like how these conversations force us into this idea of suddenly we all have to uphold policing or like the idea that policing is just, it's not. And in fact, what this shows us is what has always underlined policing, which is that it upholds this white social order. But I'm just saying that, um, you know, so it, it's quite galling as usual to see people genuinely pretending that this was always about freedom, this was about liberty, this is, you know, now we successfully got rid of the mandates and all is well, but there's been a black skin mandate in this country for hundreds of years. There's indigenous people literally until like the seventies in Halifax, you know, and across Canada couldn't drink off reserve without it being illegal. Like there are still control mechanisms on how indigenous people move around this country and move onto their own territories and move through their own territories. And I don't see any of these freedom loving politicians actually caring about that. They want the freedom to yell and complain and arm themselves with weapons and engage in their own militias and target people and say whatever misinformation that they want and just to be free because up until now it's been a little bit difficult in their mind. I mean, all society is structured like that for some people. And I think that that's what became really exposed in Ottawa 
that, you know, as this siege progressed, there were lots of Canadians supporting this, oh yeah, you know, go freedoms. And there still are who support those people. But as it progressed and you saw that they didn't stand for anything, that they just wanted to overthrow government, put um, Trudeau in Guantanamo Bay of all places, to uh, some people were saying to execute the media. And, uh, and I think after a while, people realized, you know what? These are just, white hate groups with trucks. That's all that is. This wasn't a truckers movement. This wasn't a convoy. This was just the far right coalescing together. And some of them had big trucks and they could lay the entire capital of this country to siege. And they knew they could do it because they had people who were formerly or currently in the military helping them. They had police officers currently on force, previously on force helping them. You didn't see anybody being shot and I know you would hope that they wouldn't, but it just shows just what they, it's this appropriation of freedom and liberty and security and all of those things that we've actually really har fought hard for. That it's just an appropriation of that to try to further their far right politics and make it more of a populist movement, make it something like it's an alternative, like a viable alternative. Where in the past, we did, none of these white hate groups ever got any media attention. They never got a soapbox that was sponsored by anybody else. They had, uh, they couldn't have asked for a bigger soapbox and the media gave it to them and politicians gave it to them and police gave it to them. And we'll be the ones to have to pay the price for that as we go along because that has recruited people. That has attracted people who were up until now very quiet about what they were doing. And it has empowered the large number of white hate groups that are in this country. And we all know Canada has the highest number. Um, and, and that's that's really a public safety and national security issue. This goes like well beyond politics. Martin, um, just staying on this question of um, you know, uh, Elle mentioned there's the stated politics of, of the convoy, and then there's what's actually happening and what's actually driving it. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, you know, is there any distinction to be made? Because in my mind, there is between the organizers, um, of, of these protests and the occupation and, um, some of the people who participated in, in, various cities protests um uh, for a number of different reasons yeah i mean i completely agree with um with pam about the composition of the the kind of core org organizers like yeah these these guys uh, and primarily they were guys who you know could camp out in their idling vans for three weeks those aren't working class people like you can't do that for three weeks with no income yeah. um those are middle class kind of owner operators of trucks, you know, um, uh, with a huge amount of financial backing by right wing grifters. And that to me was the composition of, um, of the core. Um, but with the help of the media initially, I think especially um, who is ready to give a platform to the right in a way they never would for, you know, popular movements from the left. Um, it was pretty incredible how they were able to launder their message, um, you know, through bouncy castles and rock and roll concerts. Um, and I, it, it was striking to me how much genuine working class sympathy, um, I think across the spectrum, um, the, the movement won. And that to me, um, was, uh, a, you know, to me, a telltale sign of how little of that discontent that is legitimate, I think, at, you know, economic discontent um, at life during the pandemic and how costs have gone up um, and how inequality has been soaring in this country even before the pandemic. I think they managed to tap, tap into that in a way that the NDP simply hasn't done because they haven't tried um, or they haven't, they haven't done it effectively, certainly. And so, um, that to me was a disconcerting element, uh, an impact of the, um, of the convoy. I mean, there's a, there's a, uh, a stat that I often cite, which is, um, 
uh, Frank Graves, who's a pollster with ECOS, um, has been polling this question for about 10 years, and he's found consistent and, in fact, slightly growing um, numbers on this. But he's found that when he's asked people um, if inequalities continue to accelerate and the benefits accrue to only those at the very top, uh, would you be surprised to see violent class conflict emerge? And two-thirds of Canadians uh, agree with that statement. Um, and so that, to me, is a, a, an indication of how much uh, rightful and righteous anger there is at the, the, the daily you know, state of affairs that the majority, you know, multiracial, working-class majority in this country endure. Mm -hmm.